Welcome to the Sunday morning chill out session. Uh, we've got a very light, light bit of topic for you to discuss this morning. Um, and if you haven't had your conflicts, I'm hoping I'm not going to put you off them, but there's a distinct possibility that's going to happen. Because the first slide you've got here, probably because of a bit of confusion, but the reason that slide's up there is um, that in 2013, uh, the then Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, gave a lecture to city bankers. And in that lecture, um, what he said, uh, I want to read the following quote. Whatever you may think of the value of IQ tests, it's surely relevant to a conversation about equality that as many as 16% of our species have an IQ below 85, while about 2% have an IQ above 130. The harder you shake the pack, the easier it will be for some cornflakes to get to the top. And for one reason or another, boardroom greed, or as I am assured, the natural and God-given talent of boardroom inhabitants, the income gap between the top cornflakes and the bottom cornflakes is getting wider than ever. Now there's Boris <coughs> Johnson supposedly on cornflakes. What that speech is basically is, is it's a textbook statement uh, of mainstream eugenics. And uh, it was almost completely ignored by the media. It wasn't seen as a big deal whatsoever. Um, about 20 years previously, maybe 30 years previously, uh, Keith Joseph at the time, um, a contender for the Tory leadership, made a very similar speech, which was just a bit more naked in its bigotry. And he immediately lost uh, any possibility of challenging for the Tory leadership. So it's a sign of the times we're in that a speech like that was completely ignored by the media and that Boris Johnson's leadership chances don't seem to have been done any harm whatsoever by that speech. The second connection with the slide, which is of a Kellogg's conflict box and uh, a story about Boris boasting about his IQ capabilities in the same kind of way that Donald Trump does, is uh, that John Harvey Kellogg, who, was, uh, who invented conflicts, John Harvey Kellogg um, founded the American Race Betterment Foundation in 1906 because as far as he was concerned, blacks and immigrants would contaminate the superior gene pool of white America. And the other thing about John Harvey Kellogg is that he invented cornflakes because they were a food sufficiently bland, and I kid you not, to stop masturbation. Yeah. <laughs> John Harvey Kellogg was not a fan of sex, let's uh, just uh, put it that. And if you want to be dubbing this stuff and you think I'm exaggerating, please feel free. Um, so anyway, that's the jokes out of the way. These things are going to get pretty serious, I'm afraid. Um, now, the thing to start with really in talking about eugenics is recognising that it's a very emotive subject, precisely because it's associated so strongly with Hitler's Germany and, uh, the, the, and, and notions of a master race. But it's important to recognise too that it was seen as progressive at the time by a whole range of people, liberals like John Maynard Keynes, the founder of the welfare state, or the original uh, of the welfare state directly, John um, uh, William Beveridge, the Manchester Guardian was a fan of eugenics, and also socialists, for example, the uh, scientist J.B.S. Haldane, who was the editor of the Morning Star's daily newspaper, the Morning Star, was also a fan of eugenics. And um, I found out recently that uh, Leon Trotsky actually had favourable things to say about eugenics as well. So it's important to therefore recognise and deal with the subject properly um, and deal with it in terms of its historical context, which is really what I want to try and get you to do. Because if you think about from today's vantage point, looking back at eugenics and seeing how incredibly reactionary it was in so many ways, um, is, is really to make it difficult to understand its evolution and why it had the appeal that it actually did. Now, eugenic ideas first developed in Britain, the United States and Germany uh, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. What did all these states have in common? They were the leading imperialist powers in the world and they all essentially assumed that Anglo-Saxon, European whites were superior to anybody else. So that, if you like, is the assumption that underlies the development of eugenics. I talk in my book a lot about the movements that preceded eugenics, but I don't have time to talk about that here. Moral hygiene, all that kind of, these kind of movements about monitoring the health of the working class uh, by do good liberals and all that kind of thing. I don't have time to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about really is first of all that it was women, people with learning difficulties and other disabled people who were the principal victims of eugenics. 
And um, that, um, I'm going to focus on what you might call the high tide of eugenics, the first four decades of the 20th century, before going on to talk about its links with scientific racism and the new right today. I'm going to touch very briefly on IQ and birth control along the way, but only because I have to. I don't really have time to discuss it in any depth. And to avoid the term, uh, to avoid repetition, I'm going to use the term eugenics to refer to eugenic ideas, eugenic policies, eugenic practices. Now, if you look at uh, this slide here, this is really quite a good representation of how eugenics saw itself and the people that believed it was this wonderful, fantastic, amazing new science that represented the cutting edge of understanding of what made human beings tick and uh, the idea that there were some people who were inferior and there were some people who were superior and that was essentially down to what some people by that time began to call genes but really it wasn't a term that was properly understood at that point. So here you have the image for the front cover of the second International Eugenics Congress uh, which was in 1921 and what you've got, uh, the roots of a tree of eugenics You've got sociology, you've got religion, you've got psychiatry, medicine, biography, archaeology, economics, politics, law, geography, ethnology, uh, genetics, anthro anthro anthropometry, as it was called at the time, mental testing, geology. So it, I think it's fair to say that the claims that eugenics was making for its importance in human life and history were not particularly modest, okay? <laughs> um, get the idea that really it's, it, it's, it's the bringing together of all these sciences. That's really what the eugenics tree, the brochure for the International Congress uh, was, was suggesting. So the term eugenics comes from the Greek word meaning well-born. It was invented by the British scientist and pioneer of statistics, Francis Galton, who actually also invented fingerprinting, for example, um, and that was in 1883. He was inspired by a chapter in Darwin's Origin of Species, um, showing how breeding domestic animals uh, could be artificially manipulated in order to produce specific characteristics. And um, he believed that using the same methods on humans, I quote, might introduce prophets and high priests of civilization into the world as surely as we can propagate idiots by mating cretins. All right? Um, now, he'd already written a book called Hereditary Genius, so I think you've got some idea already of who the geniuses are likely to be in Galton's, uh, in Galton's notions. But he thought that financial incentives would... Um, encourage his genius uh, families or superior couples to have more children. And that belief became known as positive eugenics. Now, I'm not going to talk much more about that, but I'd like to try and remember that first half of the equation. Galton's followers and the vast majority of successors in terms of eugenicists, people that practiced and believed in eugenics, soon realised that these genius families were either disinclined or unable to produce more talented geniuses. So members of the British edu edu uh, Eugenics Education Society, to give it its full name, founded in 1907, was more concerned with preventing overbreeding amongst the poor, right? And amongst, in other words, the people that were considered to have inferior genes. And uh, that is what we call negative eugenics. So we've already got a distinction between two different kinds of eugenics. And it's important just to get that out there. Galton's, uh, so Galton dies in 1911, he leaves a big uh, bequest with University College London to establish a eugenics professorship and a statistics department, including a new Galton laboratory for national eugenics. Um, people might want to talk about the recent controversy at UCL and the attempt to rename the Galton Laboratory after the International uh, Conference on Intelligence, as it was called, which was actually a secret conference on eugenics which a whole number of so-called scientific racists attended. I don't have time to talk about that, but a lot of people know about it, um, so you can uh, bring that up in the discussion. Very important campaign over that at the moment. So in the following year, after Galton dies, over 800 people attend the first International Eugenics Congress in London. Um, I'm not uh, going to tell you exactly where that was, but some people know where I work, so I'm not going to say exactly where it was, so that's a hint um, <laughs> as to where it actually took place. The main address was given by the former Prime Conservative Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour. And in 1913, the, the year after that, um, the high point of the, the, the British eugenics movement is the passing of the, the Mental um, Deficiency Act. And that authorised taking the illegitimate children of, uh, uh, of, of people de designated as paupers 
uh, into care and the removal of what were classed as feeble-minded children, once identified by IQ tests, uh, to special schools. Really what happens after that is that the, the British eugenics movement tries all sorts of uh, uh, strategies to make itself more popular, particularly in the Labour Party, the trade unions and so on, but it really uh, fails to overcome uh, what was a very middle class uh, elitist image. Now in Britain and elsewhere, eugenics won support across the political spectrum, um, supposedly bringing together, uh, as in the slide there, different branches of science. And by 1935, you have eugenic societies founded in more than 40 countries. Now, the most successful movements, if I can use that term, however, were unquestionably the movements in uh, the United States and in Germany. Now, eugenics in the United States and in Germany, in Nazi Germany, um, were dominated by fanatical racists. American eugenicists saw compulsory sterilisation as the best way to purify society of what they saw with uh, undesirables, and that included in particular newly emancipated blacks. And remember, we're not talking that long after the Civil War and Restoration and on racist backlash afterwards. Um, Jews and other races, as well as the poor, the infirm, and the disabled. 27 American states passed uh, compulsory sterilisation laws, and that mainly affected, and I quote, criminals, idiots, rapists, and imbeciles. Up to 1963, well over 64,000 people were forcibly sterilised, mostly women in California in particular. It was um, disproportionately large numbers uh, of, of women uh, were of Mexican descent. And the diagnosis included, and I kid you not, being oversexed or sexually wayward, or having what was deemed to be an abnormally large clitoris or labia. Other laws enforced segregation or marriage restrictions. Now, just to give you an idea of the picture of what American eugenics represented, what we have here is one of the, uh, the slides, sorry, shows you a fitter families fair. And uh, the, what you've got is a board above, uh, the, 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 above the, the kind of lectern where somebody's giving a lecture outdoors, a whole bunch of people sitting listening to them, notably quite a lot of women. And um, the, 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 the board says uh, American literacy on the right hand side there. And uh, it's a comparative study, as it says. So here you have the very scientific uh, presentation, or supposedly scientific presentation of what are supposed to be facts. And you won't be able to read that board, so I'll just tell you what it says. American literacy, a comparative study. And the headlines underneath are figures for literate and illiterate of four different sections of the population. Native born entire population, foreign born, and Negroes. So this was at the centre, in the other words, from the outset of American eugenics, racism. The American big business, and this is one of the crucial differences with Britain, um, actually backed eugenics right from the beginning in America. The, so the robber barons, the fortunes of the robber barons, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Harriman, they all sponsored research studies into family pedigrees. The only place really where eugenics research took place on a massive scale uh, was in the United States. Um, and it was very, very quickly clear that the studies were biased, were essentially, um, were, were facts supposedly established by prejudices in advance. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that in the discussion if we want to, but the point is that really um, up to that point, this is where American eugenics starts to inspire loads of other people because of the fact that supposedly it's got the scientific facts at hand. Hitler praises American eugenics in Mein Kampf, written in 1924, particularly that year's explicitly racist 1924 uh, National Origins Act, uh, probably the most racist piece of, uh, um, and, and that's saying something, of anti-immigrant legislation which was passed in the United States. That allocated specific quotas for particular nationalities to be allowed to get into America. There had already been legislation um, saying that you know, people who were imbeciles or feeble-minded or anything like that weren't to be allowed into the country. Other categories included homosexuals. So, um, and, and the other thing is that that, that National Origins Act was actually uh, 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 drafted, helped to draft uh, by, by a number of American uh, leading eugenicists. And in the early years of the Third Reich, uh, American eugenicists actually continued to welcome Hitler's plans as what they saw as a logical fulfilment of, of, of their own efforts. And in Germany, support for what was called, and I'll explain this later if I need to, support for race hygiene grew during the Great Depression of the early 1930s. 
Six months after the Nazis take power in 1933, they passed the law for the prevention of genetically impaired progeny. And around um, 350,000 with a range of supposedly heritable conditions, uh, such as schizophrenia or epilepsy, were sterilised. Now, right from the outset, the categories could be arbitrary. Um, severe alcoholism was, for example, included, but, um, but, but not the congenital condition, haemophilia. Um, candidates could answer all the tests correctly, but the examiner thinks you look uh, dodgy or your behaviour is rotten or your appearance isn't quite right, you can still be sterilised. So, you know, completely based on, 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 on bigotry, racism and, 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 and vile, vile fascist ideas. This is one of the most uh, prominent posters um, during the Nazi period, um, which was produced um, to back up the, 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 the new legislation. Um, an adult used in Asia begins in 1939. Sorry, I should read. I should just explain what that says. The text of the poster reads: "It's a, a picture of a guy in a white coat. Here's your, you know, classic sign of you know somebody with uh, scientific respectability, somebody in a white coat, um, and he's, uh, he's, he's, he's um, got his hand on the shoulder of a bloke who who, who looks like he's uh, got learning difficulties, if I can put it that way." And the Nazi poster says, this person suffering from hereditary defects cost the community <coughs> 60,000 rights mark during his lifetime. Fellow German, that is your money too. So this is what underlies what were called <coughs> intermention, one species of intermention, or useless eaters, uh, was, the, was the other term that was often used in relation to uh, certain kinds of disabled people um, in, in Nazi Germany. So, um, adult euthanasia begins in 1939, after Hitler extends the power of doctors so that those suffering from illnesses deemed to be incurable, in the quote, may be granted a mercy death. And the killing operation, based at four tier Gartenstrasse in uh, Berlin, was, because of that address, called the T4 programme. And the mass killing uh, that happened in the concentration camps later, with the, with the Jews in particular, was actually developed uh, against disabled people first of all, tested out under the T4 programme. We know at least 275,000 disabled people were murdered under the T4 programme, probably lots more uh, once the, 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 the programme was actually killed. It's important to point out that there was lots of resistance to the T4 programme and that led to at one point uh, one of the most prominent bishops coming out publicly against it and as a consequence the main official killing centres were actually closed down uh, in 1940. However, the killing programme continues unofficially, if you like, after that point and that's why we start to lose figures. So it's very difficult to say how many people were actually murdered formally or informally under T4 after that point. After the war, no compensation whatsoever is paid to those sterilised. I think they've seen the Nuremberg trials film with Montgomery Clift. He plays a feeble-minded guy who's been sterilised um, in, in, in the film, of a, a very good film, um, the Nuremberg trials. Um, and um, no compensation was ever paid to those that were sterilised or to the heirs of those that were murdered. Lots of the doctors that participated in T4 continued practising afterwards. And, Catherine, and calling a guy, including a guy called Von Verschuer, who Angela Saini talked about in her brilliant new book, Superior, who was uh, the mentor of uh, the Angel of Auschwitz, Joseph Mengele. He took the brains of twins and children and experimented on them and, uh, and, uh, in order to do his, uh, his research. So these are the kind of characters uh, who were at the centre of, uh, of, of Nazi eugenics. Very briefly on something called reform eugenics. Not all eugenicists, were, it's important to say, were racist or Nazis. Uh, many reform eugenicists were also concerned about inferior stock, even people that were you know, communists or socialists. Um, some of them actually believed in this stuff. Although other people attributed that inferiority to social causes, not genetic causes. So it's a very important distinction, obviously. But um, another word, I, I've got time to explain that in depth, I can in the discussion. Also promoted social reforms in healthcare, housing and education. And as we know, that in itself was not necessarily a left-wing venture. For those of you that were the meeting in the welfare state, you will know that the right and the left actually promoted and supported the idea of a welfare state, which uh, was developed in various different countries and in different political contexts over that period. For example, the Scandinavian countries are celebrated for the, the welfare states that were founded in the 1930s. But what's not uh, um, actually uh, uh, so commonly understood is that the same period saw a whole range of new laws introduced, mainly by social democratic parties, similar to Britain's Labour Party, uh, that led to the compulsory sterilisation of thousands of people 
who were classed as feeble-minded or mentally retarded. So from 1935 to 1975, for example, Sweden sterilised more people, both in absolute terms and relation and in relation to population, than any other country except Nazi Germany. I doubt very much of you actually have heard about that. Um, another strand uh, called Latin eugenics, that was quite critical of notions of Nordic uh, or Aryan racial superiority. Uh, they opposed state sponsored sterilisation as <coughs> intrusive and coercive, less offensive, if you like, to Catholic sensibilities. Latin eugenics instead favoured social programmes that promoted population growth. And uh, the revolutionary government in Russia uh, after the 1917 revolution even sponsored a left wing UA version of eugenics after 1917. Again, I have absolutely no time to discuss that because it's not the focus of this talk, um, but that's something maybe for later. A brief word on heredity and intelligence. The belief that um, intelligence was hereditary was central to eugenics, and American eugenics in particular. Um, the intelligence quotient test, as it was called, conceived of intelligence as something that was measurable, something that was innate, something that was biological. And it was first used in the American uh, in, in the United States to assess immigrants, again under the influence of eugenic activists in America, and army war draftees. Um, in fact, under the test, 30% of American army war draftees were classed as imbeciles. And despite the criticism, IQ tests very quickly became widely used in education and business to assess students and workers. And here in Britain, in 1921, uh, British psychologist and angiogenicist Cyril Burt claimed to have transformed the test into, as he said, a recognised instrument of scientific precision. And what Cyril Burke did was he used claims that IQ differences were largely hereditary and that British national intelligence was declining to create the 11 plus examination. And that really guaranteed the segregation of working class kids into inferior schools. So it's not really until the 1970s, actually, that Burke's now notorious research and findings on IQ were exposed as fraudulent. And there's a really good account of it in one of Stephen Jay Gould's books. I can't remember which one it is at the moment, but anyway, well worth looking up. I just want to say at this stage that the most damning findings against eugenics often came from within their own camp. Um, you have the Colchester survey by the British biologist Lionel Penrose, it published in 1938. Um, that confirmed the hereditary nature of some conditions, but also that some were recessive. In other words, you could skip a generation, it wouldn't automatically appear in uh, the, kids of, uh, the kids of parents. And he shows that environmental influence is actually extended to the embryo itself, that definitions of mental illness and crime, as he said, were used interchangeably, and that the overlapping of these criteria was due to class prejudice rather than based on evidence. He argued that concepts of degeneracy were themselves class-based, and here's what it says. In the upper classes, poverty is sometimes regarded as evidence of degeneracy. Similarly, the poor can complain of the degenerate, idle and dissolute behaviour of the rich. Penrose was convinced that, as he said, liability to certification as mentally deficient hinged on social class. In 1945, Penrose is appointed as a eugenics professor and head of the Galton Laboratory for National Eugenics at UCL, and by 1954, nine years later, he'd persuaded UCL to remove the term eugenics from his post, from the laboratory, and from the title of the academic journals associated with the Galton Institute. Um, the, curtain, the, the picture here shows a woman um, crying and saying, am I failing, or is it the test? And that's discussing uh, the question of, of IQ tests. Another brief word on women and reproductive rights, because it's central uh, to eugenics, but unfortunately I don't have as much time to talk about it as I would like. Basically, mass sterilisation was practised widely across the newly industrialising countries in the decades after the Second World War, after the horrors of the Holocaust are known and all the rest of it, particularly in China and India, where the impact, if you like, of the atrocities of Nazi crimes uh, wasn't, wasn't quite as, as prominent. Um, the rich are able to gain exemptions from, these, uh, from, from, from this compulsory sterilisation programme. They were partly about negative eugenics, but also partly about what Martin Empson writes about in the New Review, uh, Malthusian ideas of, uh, of, of overpopulation. So, what we've got is that um, um, the focus on reproductive sex, if you like, means that eugenics attracts feminists as well as conservatives. 
as I said, left and right. And the best one pioneers of birth control in America and in Britain, respectively, Margaret Sanger and Mary Stokes, were also very firm eugenicists. So Judith uh, talks about in her book, Judith Orr talks about in her book, in her ab ab abortion rights. Um, and they were very firm eugenicists who wanted to control, what they wanted to do was control breeding by the poor. That, 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 that was their, their main concern. And, and lots of really vile stuff in Margaret Sanger's writing about that. Now, some people argue that prenatal screening today is where the widely available prenatal screening serves amounts to a modern day what's called <coughs> consumer eugenics. I don't agree with that. I do, th I do understand that there's a lot of complex ethical debates involved with that, but I don't have time to discuss it here, and again, it's something people might want to raise in the discussion. So, <coughs> what I want to do now, sorry, the quote from Margaret Sanger reads, eugenics is the most adequate and thorough avenue to the solution of racial, political, and social problems. That's Margaret Sanger, the pioneer of birth control in 1921. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about, and then move on to talk about race, racism and the new right. Now the first thing I want to say about scientific racism is it did not start with eugenics. The notion of scientific racism, um, classifying races, judging their value on the basis of biology, that's something that really begins with a guy called Carol Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist. Um, and he classified humans into four biological races in 1735. No prizes for guessing who was at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, however, as I've described, uh, it's with eugenics really that it's most strongly associated. Angela Saini writes in her new book, Superior, uh, but highly recommended, as I said, um, about uh, the, the after the defeat of the Nazis, what really happened is a small and determined hardcore uh, of, of Nazi sympathisers uh, found journals like the Northland and in particular Mankind Quarterly uh, to try and organise uh, the ideas uh, around the ideas of what the Nazis called racial biology or applied biology. So really deliberate attempts to try and keep these alive by individuals like Richard Lynn and a whole range of other people. Uh, Richard, uh, Ruggles Gates, for example, a biologist who worked at King's College. So, Developments in biology and genetics have shown that racism, uh, since then, the genetics, they've shown that racism is based not on science at all, but on prejudice. Now, as a geneticist, Steve Jones explains, around eight-tenths of total diversity worldwide comes from the differences between the people of the same country. The overall genetic differences between races, Africans and Europeans, for example, is not much greater than that between different countries within Europe or within Africa. DNA bears a, bears a simple message that individuals are the repository of most variation. The difference between the races is less than a 50th than between man and chimpanzee. Now, what's very clear is that racism is a principal form of the new eugenics, which has really been facilitated by the rise of Trump and the rapid growth in the far right across the world. Shortly after um, Steve Bannon got kicked out of the White House by Trump, uh, he issued a, far, a, a rallying cry to the far right um, in Europe. He said, let them call you racist, wear it as a badge of honour. Now, the term alt-right, which again I don't have time to develop and discuss, but it's been talked about a lot more here already, was invented by its best known figure, uh, the American millionaire Richard Spencer. He, was, uh, he defined his unifying principles with the statement, race is real, race matters, race is the foundation of identity. Now, it's important to stress that the new far right defend their ideas under the banner of uh, you know, freedom of speech. You know, they attack this liberal establishment um, for its unwillingness to engage with the, the facts as they see it, and uh, <coughs> using race science as a vehicle to push what is essentially a small state uh, anti-welfare agenda. And the fact that scientific experts, previously seen as kind of uh, neutral and objective, you know, after the Holocaust, after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, widely distrusted, distrusted across the population, is something that's absolutely been jumped on and has been throughout by the new right since uh, the Second World War. So you have, for example, now the self-styled philosopher uh, Stephen Molyneux, um, whose YouTube channel has almost a million uh, subscribers. So here's a, a wonderful specimen of scientific racism, a brilliant cartoon by uh, Tim, Tim um, uh, Sanders, uh, the socialist worker cartoonist. And uh, what you've got is you've got a guy in classical white coat, I assume it's a guy, and uh, he's got a, a Ku Klux Klan white hood on, uh, which I think is an excellent visual representation of scientific racism. 
Now, not all of the new writers, important to say, feel so able to, uh, or willing, to openly articulate their prejudices. So you have academics at leading universities and figures such as Molyneux describing their ideas in scientific sounding terms such as race realism, hereditarianism, or even human biodiversity. And the European network, uh, the trendy bunch of youngsters, uh, je um, uh, fascists, uh, they distance themselves from explicitly fascist movements, even calling other people fascists for, for trying to oppose their freedom of speech. Um, distancing themselves uh, from the explicitly fascist movements, really its ultimate goals are, 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 are the same. You also have self-styled scientific races such as Richard Lynn, uh, previously at the University of Ulster, Noah Carroll, until tragically not, um, at the uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, they argue really that people from different ethnic, religious or cultural backgrounds are likely to share traits such as criminality or lower intelligence. And their Bible, everybody's Bible for the far right uh, scum, is uh, Burke Murray and Her Herstein's book, uh, the, the Bell Curve, which came out in 1994. Um, some of you might remember the campaign at Uni Edinburgh University to get rid of Chris Brand, who brought a book out the following year, based on the success of, uh, of, of, of Murray and Herrnstein's book, The Bell Curve. And what that book, The Bell Curve, uh, argues is that welfare or affirmative action programmes are pointless because groups such as blacks or Latinos are uh, programmed to fail. So the only solution is to stop them from breeding in the first place. This is a, 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 a recurring trope. Now, the fascists and the far right dress themselves, of course, in whatever clothes are going to suit their, their, their purposes. And while I think it's absolutely vital to refute their arguments on scientific grounds, the key is obviously political action. Richard Lynn, who I referred to at the University of Ulster, Noah Carroll um, at um, Cambridge University, and much earlier, Chris Brand uh, in the 1990s, were all forced out of their <coughs> academic posts by anti-racist campaigns by students and local activists, uh, particularly um, the anti-Nazi League in the case of Carol Brand, uh, Chris Brand, and anti-racist activists, uh, and, and both staff and students at University of Cambridge uh, just this year. They, so um, what I want to just try and bring us together, begin to bring us together about eugenics in context. As I said, eugenics first developed in the world's uh, top three economies at a time really of very intense imperialist rivalry. And I think we can identify three factors as, as, as central. First of all, there's the enormous prestige of science at the turn of the century. Think about some of the inventions. Electric light, cinema, radio, chemical fertilizer, petroleum, x-rays, a host of new medicines that and, you know, sort out diseases that had killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. All these things have made science really synonymous with modernity and progress. And you have the rediscovery of uh, Gregor Mendel's studies of pea plants in 1900, and that proves the existence of genes. And it also seemed for some people to prove Galton's arguments that characteristics were indeed inherited. It's important to say at this point that for decades after that, genetics and eugenics were essentially seen as aspects of the same science. And it's only later that you start to get clear differentiation between them, particularly in the fight against fascism in the 1930s and afterwards, as more science begins to be, begins to be proper science, if you like, begins to emerge about the nature of eugenics. So that's the first factor I would identify. The second is that a new intelligentsia really develops in, 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 in the, 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 the course of industrial expansion in these countries, in the, the, new, the most advanced countries of the period, um, but concerns itself with issues of criminality and madness particularly inside this expanding and often completely impoverished uh, working class. Um, you have these moral hygiene campaigns in the cities which had promoted improvements in health and welfare and working conditions. They're overtaken by the view that vices such as crime, prostitution and pauperism were hereditary evils. You can think about Charles Booth's photographs, uh, sorry, it's maps of London, for example. The East End of London is basically, I'm sorry to say, we're all criminals, you know, according to his map. Um, because of inferior genes or whatever, um, or you know, you didn't have these theories at the time, but you can see the, the current, recurring thread, if you like, through these notions of a problematic proletariat, essentially. And really, the idea um, towards the end of the century, you get this more, you get the shift towards negative eugenics that reflects a much 
more negative uh, um, kind of outlook by the ruling class and the middle class in general about the prospects of capitalism mu becomes much more depressed essentially. So vices like crime, prostitution, pauperism, they all start to be highlighted as hereditary evils. And sections of the middle class, particularly the professionals, linked to the new state institutions increasingly believed that the main danger facing the respective countries was degeneracy among the national stock. So class issues, in other words. In each of these countries, every single one of them, Germany, America, Britain, all of them saw over this whole period the growth of a very powerful working class movement. And that inspires a fear of the mob, which in turn sharpens concerns to separate the respectable workers um, from what was called a, a casual residuum. If you think about the terms chavs or the underclass today, then really you're talking about exactly the same notions of, of respectable workers or the deserving and undeserving, etc. How should eugenics actually be defined? This is obviously a very important issue. And there's one definition I like, and it's by um, a, a, a writer called Maloney. He identifies four threads. The belief, first of all, that human physical and mental characteristics are both inherited. Second, that social engineering is needed to control human evolution. Third, that this has to be carried out by mutual disinterested scientists. And finally, that national or racial interests must take primacy over those of the individual. Now, I don't think that's a bad definition. But it is important to understand that eugenics has also been defined much more broadly than that to include any policy aimed at improving the biological quality of humans. And if you think about it in that manner, obviously, it doesn't have quite the same uh, connotations. For some people, that would include prenatal screening, as I said, and I think that's a practice we would absolutely defend. OK. Um, this is uh, really just to show that eugenics cannot be dismissed as some kind of historical anachronism. It's, uh, uh, what the slide shows is an American protest against sterilisation in 1971. You'll notice uh, that, that many of the figures in the, in, in the slide are black. That's not a surprise. 148 female prisoners uh, emerged, uh, and I highlight this in the book, um, 148 three female prisoners that came out um, quite recently were um, sterilised in, 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 in Californian prisons in between the years 2006 and 2010. And again, they were disproportionately Latino or black. Now, although there's very little evidence that genetic engineering or developments in genetic science are bringing about a new era of eugenics, in my view, there's plenty of evidence that our rulers still share uh, eugenic assumptions. For example, the two-child limit on the uh, child benefit in this country. Very few people know about that. Far too few people know about it. It's an absolute scandal. There's been no campaign about that by the Labour Party, in my view. Um, and, of course, Boris and his box of conflicts. So, neither Darwin nor Dalton could explain the mechanism of inheritance. It's important to think about this. Darwin thought it was through blood, so did Galton. They were wrong. Um, but genetics has shown what humans have in common. For example, we share 98% of our genes with chimpanzees. So it's not biology that distinguishes human beings, it's culture. So over the 50,000 years or so of our, of our history as, as, as Homo sapiens, our cultural evolution has been through the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I don't have time to talk about this, it's known in scientific, in scientific parlance as Lamarckism. Some of you might want to raise that in the discussion, I've not had time to talk about it. So some people believe in Lamarck, some people believe in Mendel, in other words, in terms of the difference of evolution. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, I've managed to get through all that so I can slow down now. Wonderful to finish. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I didn't have time to practice this in advance, so yeah, that's why I've been uh, a bit nervous. All right, so. Biology places limits on what we can do as individuals. So for our brains and our hands, for example, right, um, provide the capacity to transcend these limits. So we can't fly as human beings but we can build aeroplanes which enable us to fly. So the point is really that our biology and our history provide the tools that we need to build a new society. So I want to try and conclude this talk by, with the following. Um, just make sure I get the right slide up at the end to finish on because I don't want to leave you with um, some horrible negative stuff. <laughs> The idea that some people are biologically inferior is central to racist ideology, and most of the key figures in eugenics assumed that white Europeans were essentially superior to other races. 
So the eugenics movement in the first four decades of the 20th century were dominated by the right, although they did include very different and divergent political strands. So essentially what you have is you have ideas of human self-improvement entangled on the one hand with class bias and bigotry on the one hand, and the beginnings of a new genetic science on the other. As I said, these, these differences don't start to become very clear until the 1930s, when a, range of, when a whole bunch of left-wing eugenicists, from people like Herman Miller in the United States to Hogben, Haldane, and, uh, and um, uh, Julian Huxley, um, British biologists, start to attack um, mainstream eugenics in much more clear scientific and political terms. So eugenics in general, and the American version in particular, provides racism with a badge of scientific respectability and the ideas of really objectivity that is somehow uh, ob objective. Until you have Nazi applied biology and the official name for the, for, 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 for the Nazi state is uh, applied by Rudolf Hess, uh, the, the idea that essentially the state was based on racial biology or applied biology. And you have the horrors of the Holocaust really smashing the idea that science and technology is somehow neutral or value free. So most eugenicists believe that the poorest societies, uh, the poorest sections of society were unfit to some degree, a problem in other words that had to be dealt with uh, by social engineering, by, the, by an enlightened elite by definition. They believed in what um, Steve Jones called the survival of the richest, that the capitalist class are fit to rule and that there is no alternative to the status quo. Now, if you want to be, you know, be polemical about it, Marxists, on the other hand, would say capitalist rule is the absolute principal cause of all social ills. Its termination is an absolute precondition for saving humanity's future. Now, far from being opposed to social engineering, I think that we envisage that as absolutely necessary on an absolutely unprecedented scale. The difference is that that social engineering would be carried out as a collective process, very different from any eugenic scheme for human betterment. It would be a collective process of self-emancipation carried out by the very same class <coughs> that eugenics condemned as unfit. Uh, I wanted to just uh, take on which, what you didn't have time to talk about, which was about prenatal screening and sort of the use, um, especially in the Repeal the Eighth campaign by the No campaigners, of a sort of what they pose as an anti-eugenicist argument to say that a woman should not have the right to choose to do what... We're, to, do, uh, to have an abortion or do whatever she wants with her own body. Um, and there were many, many posters going around Ireland at the time of children with Down syndrome. And often the fact that prenatal screening and abortion had meant that there were no more Down syndrome births in Iceland. And I think we need to be very careful about that, comrades, that obviously um, we, without a doubt, support a woman's right to choose to do whatever she wants with her body. But I think... It's, it's quite a sensitive, obviously tricky subject to discuss. And I think what we as socialists need to point out is that is the reason that people are not giving birth to children with impairments and disabilities, is that because that we don't like them? That is possibly part of it, and that's our society. But is it because our society is disabling? If we look at the social model of disability and what stops people accessing, and what makes it so hard to have a child with different or more needs than than uh, your sort of average child is the fact that we don't have any infrastructure. So when we get attacks on a woman's right to choose from a sort of eugenicist, that it is a, eugenic, a eugenicist argument, one, we have to point out that no organization in Ireland that supports children with disabilities or impairments asked for, they said, actually, don't involve us in this. We don't want to be in this. But also, um, we have to think about the the writings of several parents of children with Down syndrome, and I'm focusing on this because that's what they focused on, saying how awful it is that my child would think that the only reason I had them was because I was prevented from controlling my own body. And also, the other thing we have to think about is that in supporting a woman's right to choose, we not only support um, all the women in here, every woman, but we particularly support women with impairments and disabilities whose bodies have been the battleground of eugenics over for time and time again over the centuries that that they have the right to choose we all have the right to choose and what we actually need is a fairer society that supports everyone to live 
with every opportunity and everyone to be equal rather than um, some sort of right wing, as you were saying, fascist um, proclamation of what we can and can't do. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to continue uh, with the first speaker's theme because uh, disabled rights groups that I've been active in in Edinburgh have come out with precisely that argument, arguing that women are eugenicists if they uh, have a, a test and screening and then decide on a, on a termination. And the argument has run that uh, uh, women are depleting the stock of disabled people. It's interesting, stock is the word, the stock of disabled people. Well, there's no worries there because under capitalism, that is regularly filled up by people's workplaces. People become mentally ill, uh, become damaged, injured at work, and that is the steady, mainly the the area and the route into disability, which is a continuum, as we all know, is through being damaged while at work. So there's no worries there, but the, uh, the argument that I felt weakest on was the history of, of uh, Downs himself, because they said he was a, um, a eugenicist. Um, there was, there was a, a guy, an able guy with Down syndrome who'd done a degree in university. It's particularly difficult to argue um, this with, but it is about the rights, the choice that women make, because when people say, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, women should, uh, should not have any kind of termination, tend to be the people who do not give a damn about the quality of life once people are, are born. And so, uh, you know, it's one that we cannot give an inch on. Thanks. The comrade in grey. Grey, right there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been mentioned several times at Marxism over the weekend, really. But there is an argument, isn't there, that um, the acceptability and the leg legitimization of forms of racism like Islamophobia absolutely open up the door for the older forms of racism like uh, eugenics, but obviously anti-Semitism and so on, to be legitimized as well. And I think that's a clear message for us, isn't it, is that all of those arguments, we have to be at the forefront of taking on racism of all, in all, all its forms and every time it raises its head. But you see, the point that I wanted to make was actually the effect of eugenics and the acceptability of a eugenics actually uh, coming back onto the campuses in a big way. Uh, it's scary to see that big universities like SOAS, UCL and so on in central London have actually hosted eugenic events. Uh, this is a big development that's taking place on the campuses and I think it's intrinsically linked to a strategy from the far right that has actually been enforced across Europe around generation identity, uh, the FPU in Austria and so on, where there is a strategy of the fascists to try and organise and build uh, their uh, fascist cadre on campus in a big way. And I think this raises questions for us as socialists on campus, as uh, uh, revolutionaries and so on. But actually I think what has been seen across this year is that you can see the big challenges of taking on that forms of racism but actually uh, where socialists have organized on campus particularly in Bristol and Wolverhampton University we've been able to beat them back and I think that's a message that we have to take through I know Roddy's in the UCU union and I think this is a big challenge for us on the campuses really to make a unity between students and lecturers to take on the newer forms of the uh, racism uh, and the older forms as well. You see, Swiss students at Wolverhampton University and Bristol, every time Generation Identity have made an attempt to build in the campuses, have absolutely organised and pulled a broad, of, broad layer of people together to fight uh, on a united front basis against that. And it shows you the challenges on one hand, but you see, I think it's brilliant that the UCU comrades uh, were at the centre of initiative that labelled Generation Identity for what they are. This goes back to the free speech argument, this goes back to all of that stuff, but you see there is a level of hope there where you have revolutionaries organising on campuses, taking on the cutting edge of racism in its forms. We can build a broader layer of people to, uh, to beat back the racist tide. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make two points. Firstly, that um, I think if we take Roddy's definition, well, one of his definitions that he offered us of eugenics as being um, social engineering of supposed inherited characteristics, then I have to, we have to say that this could never be progressive because actually characteristics are not inherited. We live in a social world and they're socially determined. And therefore, I think where we look at supposed progressives who have accepted forms of eugenics, we just have to say that they're wrong. Um, and people on the left can be wrong as well as people on the right and people can accept wrong ideas. There is no progressive 
progressive role for eugenics. Eugenics historically has always been used to try and outbreed supposed unwanted characteristics. And that actually combines all the elements of race, class and gender oppression. Um, and this is my second point really, which is that Roddy quite rightly talked about how eugenics has become associated with the Nazis and the Holocaust, and this is absolutely um, actually shown the extremities to which eugenics can be taken. But actually, eugenics was already bound up with racism long before the Holocaust. You look back at the beginning of the 1900s, and you look at the scale of this, of President Roosevelt in 1905 talking about the possibility of race suicide if white women in America didn't breed more. It's absolutely intrinsically bound up with an ideal of motherhood where he talks about the need for a woman to be a good wife, a good mother, able and willing to perform the first and greatest duty of motherhood so that the race shall increase and not decrease. And we see this narrative today. We see it in Victor Orban's Hungary. Well, he's quite rightly talked about the way in which it's written into social politics policy right across the West, but also you see it with the alt-right and the far-right, talking about, you know, demographic time bombs and the threat of migrants outbreeding. The, there is a whole narrative here of racism that is also tied up with questions of class and gender. Um, and therefore, I think we have to say quite clearly, eugenics has got a horrible history from its very inception of racism and of, class, uh, and of being an anti-working class pseudoscience. Yeah, it's often argued, isn't it, that idea, racist ideas and so on are somehow stitched into the DNA of white people. They're just automatic, they're natural, they're hereditary. And I think one of the points we have to make is that these kind of ideas absolutely are not natural, that people aren't born with racist ideas. And the fact that, you know, more and more, particularly in big towns and cities, people live together, they go to school together, college together, they work together, they struggle together in workplaces breaks down the rotten, racist, oppressive ideas. And it's one of the reasons why the likes of the race scientists have to work so hard, constantly reinventing themselves and presenting new arguments to try and justify, give a scientific gloss to the rotten ideas. I'm, I'm very much looking, I haven't read yet, but I'm very much looking forward to read, reading Angela Sani's book and seeing how these arguments have developed and, and been taken on. Uh, but although the ideas aren't automatic, we do know that working class people can accept those ideas, particularly in times of misery, austerity, and so on. The idea is that somehow the reason why you haven't got a decent job, home, etc., etc., is because of black people, Jews, Muslims, and so on. The reason why security is being shredded is because of Muslims, and so on. People can accept these ideas, and that's why it is important to be able to take them on. The last point I really want to make is this. I had the great pleasure and privilege in the 1990s of being an organizer for the Anti-Nazi League at the time when Christopher Brand thought that on the back of the bell curve he could really build his academic career at Edinburgh University with his book, The G-Factor General Intelligence and Its Implications. And I mean, Patrick has talked about the importance of the campaigns today. I would just want to say something briefly about the success of that campaign at Edinburgh University and if you don't believe me you just look at Chris Google Christopher Band and see what it says on Wikipedia about how his camp, how how his uh, lectures were boycotted by the anti-Nazi League, how he ended up being sacked from his job at Edinburgh University, how his publisher ended up pulping the book because of the campaign that was organised. It was a brilliant campaign. I remember one of the things that we did was that we got. Comrade, can you sum up, please? Yeah, Professor Stephen Rose uh, did came to Edinburgh University and delivered a lecture to 300 plus students. That was brilliant. We then published that lecture and circulated it so that it was an organizing tool, not just to Edinburgh, but at universities around the country. And as I say, subsequently, Brand ended up being sacked from his job. What the point about that, of course, is that it's political organization and the intervention of political activists that made a critical difference. And that is what will be crucial in taking on the alt-right and the racist and, uh, and so on today. After this comrade at the front, we'll have the one in the stripy top. And glasses, right there, Jude. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm John Pynton. I'm a geneticist at uh, Oxford University. And I think it's very important in looking at this question to really distinguish between, you know, the kind of genetic selection that's actually happening in, uh, in IVF clinics across the country in terms of uh, deselecting, if you want to call it that, embryos that have, uh, say, a tendency towards uh, breast cancer with a BRCA mutation or cystic fibrosis from eugenics as a philosophical idea that there's some differences between races or, or classes in major things like intelligence. Because I, actually, I think we do have to defend the women's right to choose to choose not to have a, a child prone to cystic fibrosis. We can argue about all the ways in which medicine could help a person with that condition, but it's severely life-threatening, and I think that has to be the woman's right to choose. But that's very different from this eugenical idea that you know there are differences in intelligence between classes and, and races. Uh, and I think that's because it's based on a complete misunderstanding of how genes work. The more we learn about the genome and how genes work, the more we realize it's just not true that there are genes for intelligence or genes for homosexuality or genes any of violence or criminality or any of these things. And, and, and secondly, as the speaker said, actually, the, the human you know, uh, species as a whole is far more similar that, 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 than these so-called differences between, between, between races. Um, I think I've once read that there's more genetic difference between chimpanzees on the south and the bank, uh, north banks of the Congo than there is in the whole seven billion people on the planet. And that's a key thing because often science is mis the pseudoscience is, 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 is um, so they, they use the mantle of science to try and make these claims. And I think that's incredibly important to point out that it really is pseudoscience because uh, we have to look at what happened in the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, I was recently involved in the campaign to get rid of uh, Noor Carl, who was this uh, junior researcher who was elected to a prestigious fellowship at uh, Cambridge University. I signed the petition to say that he was actually a pseudoscientist, that his ideas were he was not just a racist, but he was not even uh, a proper academic. Um, I was attacked on the spectator for doing that, be, be, uh, and, and they really tried to sort of play on the idea that, you know, this is about freedom of speech, blah, blah, blah. I, I think the reason it's so important is not only because those ideas are used to justify the kind of the, the acts of the kind of racist who, you know, tear someone's veil off or spit in someone's face or even murder them. But if we look at the Nazi Holocaust, what actually, who were the people who actually carried out those murderous acts in the concentration camps and, and, and attacks on these ill people? There's often this idea that it was just these, you know, evil monsters, not, not normal people. Actually, the reality is that the, the whole of the medical profession, more or less, went along with that. It was only respectable doctors who took part in, in, in those activities. And unless we unmask these kind of pseudoscience now and expose it for what it is and where it can lead, I think that's exactly where we could be heading. Um, yeah. in the white. Well, first of all, thanks, Roddy, for what I think was an absolutely brilliant talk. And I think, you know, for the sense of actually making sure that we see eugenics as not just some historical curiosity of the past, I think is absolutely important. I mean, I attended UCL in the 1970s, where a lot of these ideas originated, and it was still very much in the air. And Cyril Burt, who was the origins of the IQ test, we've got to remember, he lied about his studies. He made up the results. And the whole of the British education system was based on false studies of pretend twins that he made up and actually just to remind people again it's not a historical where I'm from in Northern Ireland the IQ test was only abolished in 2008 and they still have divided schools because people don't accept that you know there isn't some inbuilt IQ I mean some of the IQ tests had a tennis court and asked people what was the missing thing on this picture well if you had come on this was an immigration test in America if you'd come from somewhere else in the world you'd never seen a tennis court you didn't know but the idea that this was something biological and I think what's so important about what's coming out of this talk and many others this weekend is the the thing that the the far right and fascists are doing and the racists doing the rebranding exercise of trying to intellectualize their racist project to give it theoretical a uh, basis this is something that we have to be seeing through and I think that sense of it's giving it a man in a white coat isn't it that's what they're trying to do to the racist project and I think the rebranding when you mentioned racial biodiversity I think it's so important to understand what this is because we're all for diversity aren't we all of us we think that's a positive thing but of course what they mean is there's the these races that are separate, you know, there's whites, there's blacks, there's Asians, there's Roma, whatever it might be, and they should be separate. That's the diversity bit, not that we should all be together. And I think, therefore, for us, and I think Esme's right to point out that the positive and negative eugenics are happening today. Policies in Europe, you know, when Orban says he wants more Hungarian children, he says it's not just about numbers. It's not, he doesn't want more 
immigrants, he wants Hungarian children. And he's rewarding them with free you know, loans and cars. Italy are giving people plots of farmland to have more than three children. But at the same time, cutting back on reproductive rights and, and abortion rights. And I think just finally, when people say that sometimes uh, pro-choice activists like ourselves are said that we're practicing eugenics, this happens about racism too. In America, the anti-abortion people put up big posters with a black pregnant woman saying, your child could be the next president of America, could be the next Obama. You know, don't commit racial genocide, implying that if you have an abortion as a black woman. I mean, obviously these people never liked Obama because, you know, these are the far right. But this is how it could be a, a thrown against us. So, so important that we understand what's underneath their terms and their rebranding because this is still the same old racism, just happens to be in new clothes. <laughs>
a lot of people who are bemoaning um, the idea that Britain is going to leave the EU um, are talking about I'm a European, I'm a European and like using that as somehow an internationalist <coughs> banner to raise against so-called sort of racist Brexit. Um, but it's got a very nasty, leaves a nasty taste in your mouth when, you know, people are going around going, I'm a European, I'm a European. I mean, I would like to say against what are you a European? In, di in, in distinction with what are you a European? Now, some people will be saying, I, as opposed to a little Englander, okay, we can argue with that. But quite, I'm sure a lot of people are very, very Come wittingly up, wanting to be a European as distinct to any other part of the world, perhaps African. And I would like to pose that as a question as well. Um, as you may have noticed, we've got a slight change of environment and uh, that's because we didn't quite manage to finish the meeting as we got rudely interrupted by the fire alarm. So I'm now um, coming back a little bit later than intended. Okay, so there was a few points I'd like to come back on. The first is uh, about uh, prenatal screening. Um, as I said, in my view, it's not at all a eugenic uh, policy or practice. I think that uh, people have kids not for, you know, some notion of a brave new world uh, and it's not the case that they don't have kids because they hate disabled people either. I don't think there's a plot to get rid of uh, Down syndrome uh, kids amongst uh, people that decide to not to have a child because uh, they're told that it's very possible that they may have a child who has Down syndrome. I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that they live in a very disabling society and that people have to take these decisions on the basis of the extreme disadvantage that currently faces disabled disabled people. So that, that, that's what I would say about that. I think the women's right to choose uh, is, is, is the key issue here and uh, it's not something that we can hedge around the qualifications. Um, somebody else mentioned Langdon Down. He's quite an interesting character. Um, he, uh, in some senses, was quite a progressive guy because he uh, pioneered uh, the. He be, he became head of Arrowswood Asylum, and uh, he ended all the punishment there, and uh, he set up uh, lots of education programs and so on. But he was also a very contradictory character. Uh, he much of his work on Down syndrome. Uh, as it became known as progressive. But actually what he did was label uh, what he called uh, classifications of idiots according to ethnic categories. So for him, Down syndrome uh, children were reminiscent of Mongolians, as he called them. So therefore uh, the term Mongol um, was attached to uh, Down syndrome uh, people really by, 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 by down himself. Um, so if you like, um, he was writing well before the period of eugenics. Uh, the key word in which he defined, made that definition was uh, 1866. So it really predates eugenics quite considerably. You could say, if you like, that racialized descriptions of hereditary conditions might kind of anticipate eugenics. Um, so, so yeah, I suppose you could say that about Langdon Down. Um, I want to say something about the notion of a European, which um, somebody brought up, uh, you know, what, what is it to be a European? Who are you defining it against? And I think that's a very good way of putting it, particularly in the context of the current debates around the European Union. Uh, very interestingly, there was a book uh, written by uh, one of the group of left-wing biologists, eugenicists in Britain, a guy called Julian Huxley, and he wrote that book with another bloke um, saying, really, it was a polemic against Nazi racism, it was a polemic against the idea of an Aryan super race. But the book was called We Europeans, and that kind of um, gives you a hint as to the content of it. Because although he uh, polemicised against the idea of race in general and of uh, a a a Aryan uh, uh, race, race biology in particular, um, Huxley did believe that white Europeans were basically superior. And he certainly believed that um, Negroes, what he called Negroes or black Africans, uh, were not as intelligent as other human beings, he said, until we know otherwise. So there are clearly um, difficulties with that. And that kind of outlook of left eugenesis in the 1930s, as with many other uh, people, uh, was highly questionable in relation to race in general, even when they were uh, polemicizing against uh, the Nazis. I want to stress that um, eugenics is absolutely not progressive and at no stage did I want to suggest that. Um, what I do think is important 
is that uh, when I said was seen as such, what I was meaning was that lots of socialists at the time uh, wanted to identify with cutting edge uh, science, with the best practices of science and, uh, and, and therefore engaged with eugenics in that sense. Because, as I said and emphasised, uh, eugenics and genetics were for a very long time essentially seen as two sides of the same coin um, and one, for one, some people as exactly the same thing by, by other people. Um, it's very much clearer to us now what uh, things are hereditary and what's not. Uh, the, 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 the notions of uh, racial inferiority, that the notions of intelligence is hereditary and so on. Um, you know, we've got a lot more scientific understanding of these things than was available to the those that were writing then. Um, so the, the, nobody has these excuses anymore. And that's why eugenics is very much associated with the political right now even though lots of people, um, you know, uh, um, entertained it quite seriously at the time. And that really brings us to the principal form of eugenics today, the whole question of scientific racism. It's absolutely uh, the case that we, it's our right to say we are not going to be educated in racism, we are not going to be educated in racism, in particular by racists, whose only uh, an interest in actual education is, is to perpetuate notions of scientific racism, a return of Nazi ideas and fascist ideas, uh, given, given some sort of scientific window dressing, and that's really what scientific racism is all about. It was brilliant to hear the example uh, from Edinburgh University of what was done there in 1995. Similar things are been done to get rid of Noah Carroll uh, at University of Cambridge, uh, as John uh, as John Parrington uh, mentioned in the discussion, and uh, similar things have been done elsewhere in terms of getting rid of Richard Lynn, for example, um, and, and, and Trinity College. So I think that there are. It's very, very important that we fight for to, 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 to get to get the ownership of these kind of ideas. That we fight to, to that we fight to make sure that racism doesn't make an a, a, a comeback in academia any more than generation identity are allowed to get hold of our campuses. Uh, eugenics needs to be consigned to the dustbin of history and scientific racism alongside it. Thank you.